Hi everybody, this is God Sad for the Sad Truth. In chapter 2 of my 2007 book, The Evolutionary Basis of Consumption, I provide a table wherein I list a broad range of disciplines that have uh, been Darwinized. And what I mean by that is that uh, evolutionary principles have been incorporated within the study uh, of phenomena within that particular discipline. Now for some f disciplines, uh, how you go about infusing the field with evolutionary theory might seem reasonably intuitive. So for example, nutrition, it might be reasonable to assume how evolutionary theory might inform the study of nutrition. But there's a wide range of other fields that you might be surprised are equally amenable to uh, the infusion of evolutionary thinking. Uh, and so in several of my writings, I have sought to demonstrate the explanatory power that is reaped by infusing, you know, any field involving biological agents with evolutionary theory. Uh, for the purposes of today's clip, I wanted to uh, demonstrate how one can use evolutionary principles in exploring how to best design man-made spaces, things like, you know, urban design, landscape design, uh, interior design, commercial scapes, let's say retail stores or, or malls or hotel lobbies. So are there things that we can use from evolutionary theory that can help us, uh, if you'd like, optimize how we go about designing a particular space? And here, of course, optimization, we're not referring to, to say, you know, cost minimization, right? So an architect, an architect might be interested in, uh, you know, putting up a building in a way that uh, cost is the most important issue to uh, optimize, in this case, to minimize cost. Here, what we're referring to is how do you optimize the evolutionary relevant cues that humans are titillated by? In other words, what types of environments are those that adhere to certain evolutionary principles uh, that our brains have come to expect and feel most comfortable in? And so here I'll use two principles. One is, uh, if you look at the uh, the image in front of you. One is prospect refuge theory and the other is biophilia. So prospect refuge theory is a theory that basically argues that we prefer, uh, for example, landscapes that afford us prospect and also grant us refuge. So in other words, be able to see without being seen. And so there are certain types of environments uh, that either score very highly on prospect, prospect refuge or not. Uh, and then depending on whether uh, that particular environment uh, does or does not adhere to prospect refuge, uh, then we either like it or don't. Uh, biophilia refers to uh, the idea that we have this innate love of nature. Uh, we love to be in communion with nature. There's all sorts of studies that show that you know going for a walk in a park has all sorts of uh, physical and mental uh, you know, health benefits. And so the, the idea is that, well, how can we take these principles and then apply them uh, in designing all sorts of spaces around us? And so what I thought I would, I would do here is show you some uh, images of what I would consider to be a, a version that adheres to these evolutionary principles and one that violates them. So if you look at the top two uh, leftmost images, uh, on the left we have a cafe that has certain warm colors that very much adheres to prospect refuge or there are all sorts of nooks and crannies where people can sort of hide while seeing other people walk by right i'd like to see without being seen uh, whereas on the other hand the corresponding image of a you know it looks like a high school cafeteria uh, is not where I'd like to go to hang out uh, for a nighttime cafe, right? In this case, you're trying to optimize space. You're trying to fit in as many loud high schoolers into a space so that they can eat and then leave. Uh, prison cafeterias are built the same way, right? You're not trying to create prospect refuge and trying to create warm feelings. You're trying to sort of maximize space in a way that allows you to serve a very functional goal whether it be feeding high schoolers or prisoners. 
so if you just look at the top photo, one adheres to this prospect refuge mechanism, the other one doesn't. Uh, if you look at the next one below it, you have a building that is very, very drab. There's very, very little greenery. It looks like those buildings from, you know, the Soviet Union, the old Soviet Union, uh, or buildings uh, that we might see in the uh, inner city projects in big American cities, whether it be in Chicago or New York. Uh, so those are buildings that were put up to minimize costs, right? Put them up as quickly as you can so that people can have affordable housing. But in those cases, the design elements did not focus on, you know, adhering to prospect refuge theory or to biophilia. If you look on the corresponding image with the pedestrian walkway with all sorts of greenery and so on, there are all sorts of cues that are profoundly attractive to us. We very much wish to interact with that environment. And as a matter of fact, there is a, uh, a wonderful index that has been developed, and it's a walkability index that basically scores neighborhoods based on how walkable they are. There's all sorts of metrics that you could use in constructing that index. And it turns out, perhaps not surprisingly, that neighborhoods that are walkable have people in them that have better health, better mental health, uh, for all sorts of reasons. And again, here you can hold constant things like socioeconomic uh, conditions. So it's not just a function of, you know, a walkable neighborhood is one where people are richer, hence they have more access to, uh, to health care. No, there is something inherent to a walkable en environment that, that has a downstream effect on people that they become healthier, right? Uh, if you look at the one below it, the, the bottom two images in the left panel, you have one of two schoolyards. The left schoolyard basically looks like the schoolyard of a federal penitentiary, right? Completely drab, not a single uh, ounce or iota of greenery, whereas the one on the right, of course, uh, has all of those cues. It has hills, it has greenery, it has little well, prospect refuge elements. Uh, you know, one of the reasons why we chose the particular elementary school where our daughter is currently attending was uh, the fact that they had a beautiful green backyard or schoolyard where children can play. So certainly a very, very important element. And then uh, the last, on the, on the right panel, the top and bottom uh, images, uh, here, this is where you use biophilia in restorative environments, like in a hospital room. So if you look at the uh, top uh, image, uh, the colors, uh, uh, the general aesthetics, and here's the really important one, a view, a window to the world, whereas the bottom one doesn't have any of those uh elements. Well, it turns out there was a study done, I think in 1984, published in, I think it was either Nature or Science, where they took two groups of patients that had had the exact same surgery. One group, they gave them a, a hotel room, uh, I mean, a hospital room with a, a window. The other one didn't have a window. And just that particular experimental manip manipulation had a an effect on you know the subsequent health metrics, whatever those might have been. Uh, so something as simple as only having a window or not, right? Windows provide uh, natural light. Natural light has been linked to all sorts of uh, interesting effects. And so here you see in completely different environments how we create a cafe environment, how we build walkable, uh, biophilic uh, urban landscapes, uh, how we create schoolyards, how we create restorative environments that are biophilic, uh, all are informed by particular understandings of evolutionary principles. Uh, so there you have it. Uh, there's actually a field called evolutionary architecture, which maybe I'll talk about in a future uh, clip. There's also a f f uh, biophilic architecture. Uh, very, very interesting uh, disciplines. As a matter of fact, in my uh, 2011 edited book, evolutionary psychology in the business sciences, there's a chapter on how you use these principles when you're designing uh, retail environments. So there you have it. There's no escaping evolutionary theory. It is everywhere around us. I hope that you're having a good uh, weekend. Uh, please share this clip if you enjoyed it. Talk to you soon. Cheers.